Hi there, Stephen Rosell here. I'm going to spend a little time going over XGen, some, some basics as well as some tech, tips and tricks, and talk about different uses for XGen. A lot of people think of XGen as a film-centric tool, but you can use it just as easily to populate uh, an environment for something like a video game and then ultimately export the, the assets that you create into, um, into a game. So I'll talk about the different output modes uh, towards the end, but let's start with just a basic example. So here I've basically got a terrain and I've got a bunch of trees laid out along those ter the terrain. I've laid them out procedurally, but then I've kind of artistically controlled uh, where they are and, and had a little bit of control over things like the scale and, and proportions and so on. So for starters, let's go to the beginning. Now in order to get started with XGen, you have to begin with some models essentially that you would have built in a traditional way. So here I have three trees. These are all just standard Maya meshes. And you basically want to take the Maya meshes and convert them into what are called archives so that they can be used with XGen. Now the process to that is very simple. The first thing you want to do is basically select an object and then go into the XGen menu set and export that object as an archive. So what that's going to do is it's basically going to convert it in a couple of different ways. For starters, I have to choose where I want to export this to. I'm going to use my local project, but you could use any repository uh, at any remote location. So I'm going to set this to be my winter tree one, and then I'll export that. So what that's doing is it's exporting it and creating a repository in my project called XGen. If I go into the archives folder, you can see now I have a, a dot XARC file, which is a XGen archive, and that references several other files. One is an Olympic cache file, which is basically for loading the geometry in. Another is a material file, which associates a texture and a shader with the object. And a third is an MA, MI folder, which basically relates to mental ray if you're going to actually render these out, which we're not going to do in this case. So let's go back in and we'll talk about how we can actually uh, speed up this process. I could actually create a whole library of these trees, anywhere from two to hundreds, and then I could batch export them using the batch convert. What that'll allow you to do is just simply point to some existing files. So I've got my tree files already set up in the file system. Now I can basically take those and I can batch convert them into XGen format. And then for the naming convention, I'll just use the name of the file. So now if I go back to that previous folder, what you can see is I've got an XGen folder which contains three archives, Winter Tree 1, Winter Tree 2, and Winter Tree 3. Now these are going to be used when I populate my environment with the forest. So now I want to take those three archives that I saved out and I want to bring those in using XGen. And for starters, I'm going to go in and create what's called a description. You have to select the target that you want to basically attach these to, so the terrain in this case, and I'm going to create a description. And from here I want to name this something uh, descriptive, for lack of a better word. I'm going to call this my winter tree description, which will contain all the varieties of winter trees. Then I can put that into what's called a collection, which is basically essentially like a group of descriptions. So this would be my tree collection. So the tree collection could contain winter trees, jungle trees, forest trees, summer trees, whatever it may be. Now I'm going to go in and choose the type of primitive that I want associated with it. So instead of splines for long hair or groomable splines for short hair, I want to choose geometry uh, or archives. And then I want to uniformly place those on my surface initially and then I'll change that later. But for now I'm just going to use expressions to uniformly place this on my surface. I'm going to overwrite the existing collection which I had created previously. And now what you'll see is I get a bunch of dots essentially uh, placed on my terrain which represent the centers of the faces which it's going to use as reference points for uh, snapping and positioning my objects. So now what I want to do is bring in the various archives and I can do that directly from this interface here. So I have the primitives tab which basically points to or allows me to point to archive files. So I can choose one or I can choose multiple depending on how many I want to associate. You can add more later if you want to as well. So I'm going to start just by adding uh, the first one, winter tree, and apply, and then I'll bring in the materials with that. And then there's one little glitch um, with XGen where you have to actually go in and just touch the frame number here. If you just touch that attribute, it'll trigger the load of the textures. It's a little bit frustrating or annoying, but once you know it's there, it's a simple fix. And now what you'll see is I get a bunch of the same tree basically 
uh, filling my entire scene. So you can see that each one of these trees is exactly identical. So this is where I would want to go in and add additional archives. So again, I could have done this before or after. I'm going to just do it after the fact. I'm going to add tree two and three. And now I'll refresh that. Again, I'll just touch the frame and that should trigger my textures. And now what you'll see is I get three different tree types that are randomly placed into my scene. Some tall, some short, some medium. Now I've got a very, very dense um, layout of these trees in my forest. You'll notice it does call the, the rendering of these based on the camera. So I can go in and I can re-render this if I expand my camera frame. And you can see there that I'm getting thousands, if not tens of thousands of trees. So here I probably want to go in and change the distribution. So I can do that when I'm working in uniform mode with this spacing attribute. The higher I make the spacing attribute, then the fewer trees I'm gonna get based on the spacing in the scene. But what you'll see is I get this very kind of uniform layout, almost like an orchard, which may be what I want, but I don't really want it in this case. I actually wanna go in and I wanna set this to be random. So I'm gonna set this to be randomly placed, and then the random, instead of using a, a spacing attribute, uses a density attribute, which I can then dial down, and by dialing down the density attribute, I can control the number of trees in my forest. So I've got that a little bit higher, let's make it something like 0.2, and there we get something that's a little bit more manageable. You can see as I pull back, again, I can re-render that, and it'll basically fill in the blanks uh, that, that were left out for performance reasons before. So now you can see I'm getting kind of a random assortment of these trees. So I've got the short tree here, I've got the medium tree here, I've got the tall tree here. So now I might want to go in and actually control the distribution of these random trees. So let's actually make this density to be a bit smaller. Let's make it something like 0.05 just so I can see this a little more clearly. There we go. Now I can actually see the, the where they uh or rather how they're distributed. So what's happening by default is it's going to evenly distribute them across my surface. So I'm gonna, essentially gonna get 33% placement for each one of these three trees. If I had four, I'd get 25%. You can actually control that using something called the pick attribute. So if I scroll down, I've got a pick, excuse me, it's actually the index attribute, but it's using a pick expression. So the pick expression by default is just going to randomly and evenly distribute these. But you can actually modify this pick expression by adding additional numbers. So if we have three um, archives, or if we have four archives, then we can add numbers to associate with those archives. So for instance, I know that the first tree is the tall tree. So I can make the tall tree show up 90% of the time, and then I can make the short and medium trees show up 5% of the time. Now when I enter this, what you'll see now is I get mostly tall trees. But if I move through here, every once in a while, 5% of the time, I'm going to get the short tree. But again, I'm getting mostly tall trees. So now I can go in and modify this in different ways. So let's say I want 10% tall trees, I want 20% medium trees, and I want 70% short trees. Now when I hit enter, you can see that 70% of the trees are now going to be of the short variety with, again, 20% of the medium and 10% of the tall ones, which you can see back here. So I can control the proportion of these trees very uh, accurately. Um, and I can also go in and I control where they show up as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. So let's actually make these something like 25%, let's just do something like 25% tall, I'll do 25% 20, uh, short, and then I want the other 50% to be medium. Now I'll hit enter, and I'll get a new distribution, and if I pull back all the way, you can see again it calls out, so all I have to do is just refresh that, and now you can kind of see how those get distributed. So again, it gives you very nice control over the distribution. Now the next thing I want to control is the actual proportions and scaling, not the placement, but the actual scale of my objects. So I can go in and I can control not only the scale, but also the things like the rotation, because right now each of these is rotated in the same exact manner. So if you take a look at these two trees right here, the trunks and the root or the branches of the trees are angled exactly the same way. So what I can do is I can go in and I can add a twist to this, and the twist will actually turn these trees, but it does it uniformly. So this is where expressions come in. So I can actually go into my expression editor and I can feed in a very simple randomization here, and I can choose a random value 
value of say negative 60 to 60 degrees and now each tree is going to be randomly rotated so that I get a lot of variety in the position and orientation. So now I have may maybe two identical trees next to each other but they don't necessarily look identical because they're each randomly rotating in a different direction or a different amount. So we can do the same kinds of things with scale uh, and scale is actually going to be controlled with three attributes. I have a length which I can actually set by uh, editing a slider value and then I have a width which actually is independent of the depth. In most cases though you want to actually control these not only randomly but also uniformly in the sense that they all scale the same amount. So I'm going to set these back to 1, 1, and 1 which will give me my default settings and now instead of putting a random expression in each one of these individually I'm going to create a custom expression which will allow me to control all of them. So I'm going to call this my scale. I'm creating a new expression and then I'm going to go in and I could either just set a simple slider if I wanted to actually just control this with a value. Um, so if I set a slider and then I went in and I fed in my scale into each one of these, then I'd have a single slider that would control each. So I'll say my scale and I'll accept. And then when I go back to the expression attribute, the slider will now drive the vertical scale. But I can also feed that same one, my scale, I can just copy that and I can feed it into the width and I can feed it into the depth, which is basically going to control a uniform scale for all of these. So now when I go to expressions, I can take that scale and you can see I can uniformly scale all these. And then I can go in and I can add randomization to this. This is where I would go into the expression editor and I would basically go in and I would customize this by taking the dollar a which is basically created anytime I want the slider so when I hit dollar a equals then I get this slider right here which drives that value so now I can take that value dollar a and I can multiply it by a random value and for this in this case I'll choose rand and I'll choose something like 0.7 and 1.3 which will give me a random value between 70 percent and 130 percent essentially so now I accept this actually I need to get rid of that space there so now I accept this and now you can see I get randomization which is amplified by a slider so some of these trees are going to be tall some of them are going to be short and then I can offset that with a uniform uh, setting so again, this gives you um, a lot of control over the placement. This gives you a lot of control over the position and orientation of your various objects in kind of procedural ways. But then on top of that, you can also layer in more artistic controls that would essentially allow you to fine tune the look and feel of your, of your layout. So let's go in and add a little bit of scale to this just to amplify these a little bit. I might actually want to amplify that a little bit more than one, so something like 1.2. And now I've got a pretty, pretty dense forest with a, a fair amount of randomization. But what I want to do now is actually go in and control different parts of my forest in different ways. So for instance, I may want some parts of the forest to be tall and some to be short. So this is where guides come in. So guides can be used independently of expressions or they can be used combined with expressions. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to set this primitive type of primitive attributes to be controlled using guides. It will not ignore the existing expressions, but it will allow me to use guides as a, as a modification on top of that. So then I go to the top toolbar up here where I have my add or move guides tool and I'm basically going to go in and actually let's just remove the render of that. I'm just going to go in and I'm going to place these guides at different points. So I'm going to put one there, one there, and one there. So I've got five guides now. These guides are all uniformly scaled uh, or, or they haven't been changed yet anyway. And so if I render this I'm going to get the exact same effect. But if I were to go in here and actually grab one of these guides, whoops actually let's just uh, quit out of that. And let's grab that guide and let's scale this up something like that and then re-render. Now I'm going to get a section of the forest which is very very tall very very large where the perimeter on the outside is very small. So I can this is just a simple transform I can simply just undo the scale of that and then re-render that and I get the regular effect back. So let's say over on this hill I might want to have the trees a little bit larger depending on my point of view and then over on this side I might want to have the trees a little bit smaller 
And then I can also go in and I can add a little bit of rotation or something like that. And now I get kind of some artistic control over the transition of my, of my forest. So you can see over here I have a very thick forest. Over here I have a much smaller set of trees. And then I still have the randomization going on underneath the hood. So I can still go back to the expression and using my slider I can modify that expression which basically just gets augmented or modified using the guides on top of that. You can also do interesting things with uh, angles. So I can basically take this guide here, rotate it that way. This guide here, rotated, rotate it this way. And I can basically control the direction of the trees. So over here, I have the trees going one way. Over here, I have the trees going another way. And we can even exaggerate that a little bit more. But you get the basic idea. This gives me, again, kind of an artistic control over how um, my, my trees or whatever object they are happen to be positioned or oriented in my scene. These again are just transforms, so I can go to the channel box and if I don't like the rotation, I can just zero that out for each one of these. And by zeroing that out, I'm basically removing that rotation that I created. I go to the XGen window, just refresh that, and now I get vertical trees once again. So another thing to point out is that the entire time that I've been working on this, I've been working relative to the existing terrain. So if I were to pull in here a little bit and change the terrain, say for instance grabbing a point here and using something like soft select to create kind of a, a little hill, if I update that and then click refresh, then the trees are going to go along for the ride. So now you can see that the higher I make that hill, the higher the trees are going to be. And then I can control the orientation or the direction, either procedurally or using the guides as I did before. So this is all bound to the existing or rather uh, initial terrain that I started with. So a couple other things to point out is that right now I've got a random distribution of these trees across my entire terrain. But I may actually want to control this also more artistically. I may want to go in and, and create paths or create slopes through my forest. So what I can do is go to the primitives tab and at the top where I have the mask attribute, this is basically an amplifier for the density. So if I were to go in and dial up the density, you can see that I get density everywhere. If I were to go in and add a mask, then it's going to multiply that density, either removing it or adding to it. So what I want to do here is basically go in and create a map and then I want to start out by making it black. Black is going to be zero, white is going to be one. So I'm going to create my map. This is using PTEX under the hood so it doesn't actually require any UVs on your object. You can have UVs and you can convert to and, to and from UVs but you don't need them to start with. So at any rate, I've basically erased all of the density. I've removed all of the density of my forest. Now I can go into my paint tool. This is just the standard paint tool in Maya. And I can set my colors to control, uh, or rather my values to control where I'm painting and where I'm not. So I'm just going to use a solid brush. I'm just going to paint a big white section in here. Now if I were to go into XGen and save this, what you'll see is wherever I get white, I get trees. Wherever I get black, I get no trees. So now I can go in and I can start to paint kind of areas in here. So let's do something like this. I'm going to leave a, a little patch here where I don't want any trees growing. I'm going to have a little path going here through the forest, something like this. I'm not going to go nuts with that, kind of paper it off over this direction. And then I'll have a full forest on this side. So now basically I'm going to have a nice little path running through here. And as soon as again, as soon as I go in and save this, you can see it will generate the forest based on the, the, the map that I've, that I've painted out. So now I can actually just quit out of the tool. I can come back into the Maya interface and I can kind of come in here and get an idea of what this is going to look like from different points of view. So now you can see I've got this, again, nice kind of slope going through my forest and I've got, again, nice randomization in the trees, but at the same time I've got some control over a variety of these settings. So let's say I decide they're all a little bit too big. I can go in and start to thin those out a little bit, thicken those up a little bit, and I can modify the expression underneath if I choose to. So ultimately what I want to do is actually go in and control, or rather convert, all of these objects into actual Maya objects, transforms and meshes. What you'll see right now is that these are not selectable objects. I cannot actually select these if I right click on them I get no list of components or I get no access to components. These are cache files that are basically loaded in uh, and uneditable. I can't actually do anything with them at this point. 
So I need to convert these so that I could then potentially export them into a game engine so that I could actually run around inside of this environment uh, as though it were real. So this process is actually very straightforward. It's basically a modification of the output settings. So we have our primitive tab and then we have our preview output tab. In here we can set things like colors as well as uh, render parameters. But if I scroll down under output settings, I can switch between a render, which would basically mean software render, to a MEL file. I can actually output a variety of different files which contain different information. But for this particular case, I want to generate a MEL file, which is essentially going to allow me to rebuild this entire structure, this entire layout, using simple transforms and objects. So I'm going to put this onto the desktop. So we'll just go to the desktop, and we'll say I want to save it there, and I will output my MEL file. Now I'm going to go into the script editor, and from the script editor, I'm actually going to load in that MEL file. So let's go to the script editor. And for starters, I want to actually just remove what's in here. So I've actually got a bunch of stuff in there from a previous example. But let's just get a clean slate here. And under MEL, with the MEL tab open, I want to go to File Open. And on the desktop, I'll have my Winter Trees file, which I just exported. Did that live. And here, I will actually have a basically a set of commands. You can see these are just standard MEL commands. And if I scroll through this, this is a set of commands that will import the trees, create the transforms, and then instance those trees across those transforms. It's about 3,200 lines. You obviously wouldn't want to build this manually. But there's one little thing that we need to know about, and that is that by default, the ABC import is using a namespace, which is going to cause an issue if you run this by default. So let's actually just pull this to the side, and we'll start from scratch. So I'm actually going to go into the channel box here, or rather, sorry, the outliner. And I'm going to take everything that's associated with XGen, all of the guides, all of the cache files, and I'm going to delete those. So you'll see that that actually removed all of the XGen content from my scene. If I actually look in here, I no longer have a, a description in my scene. So what I want to do is now replace all that XGen information with these actual um, transforms and, and objects or meshes. So I need to make two simple changes I'm going to pull in. And this is something that could be automated very easily, but I'm just going to do it manually. For every archive that we have, it's going to use an ABC import in order to bring that into my Maya scene. So the thing that I need to change, just something to be aware of, is there's a flag, an FT flag, which does some sort of an object filter, which is unnecessary and will actually cause an error. So I'm actually going to go to each ABC import line, and I'm just going to delete that flag. It's the flag followed by a string. So here's another one, ABC import. It's using uh, it's namespace tree3. I don't even know why it's doing that. I'm going to scroll to the next one, FT tree1. So those are the three lines that will create the uh, initial import for my mesh. And now what I want to do is actually, once I've deleted those, those flags, is just select everything in the script editor, hit enter, and now one by one, it's going to go in and build all the trees that were previously created procedurally. So now you can see if I pull out all the way, you can see if I step through my hierarchy here, each of these trees is a unique object. So this is now just a transform. All of the procedural information from this, the randomization in the twist got converted into rotation. The guide placement where I added rotation and where I added scale, as well as the underlying procedural scale that I added, got converted into simple transform scale. So you can see this tree is scaled at 98%. This tree is, is 1.07. This tree is 0.8. So all of that randomization got converted into simple transform values. So now each one of these trees is completely unique and completely independent um, in terms of its transform. But if I pull in here a little bit, what you can see, if I get in here close enough, is that these, if I grab this tree and I go into my vertex menu, you can see that if I modify one tree, it's actually going, let's turn off my soft select there, it's actually going to affect all of the other neighboring trees, which may or may not be what I want. I might want instances, but I, I might want to also make some artistic decisions about how uh, these trees look. So for this tree, for example, I may actually want to go in and modify that one tree. So what I can do is I can grab that one tree, and let's just actually go into the object mode for that tree, and I can convert that tree from an instance into a regular object. So if I go to Modify, Convert, 
I can convert this from an instance to an object. Now this becomes its own unique tree. If I were to go in and grab some vertices on this tree, you could see that the vertices are unique and independent. So I can go in and I can make some artistic changes. Uh, for instance, I can you know grab something like soft select and dial that down a little bit and start to modify or tweak some of the individual branches to change the look of the tree, something like this, without actually affecting any of the other trees. Maybe I want to add a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a crooked trunk to this particular tree or something like that. Now you can do this with all of the trees or you can do it with just specific trees. If I were to go in and grab all the transforms which are under this group, so it'll create a group with the name of the collection. And then I can go in and grab all of the underlying transforms and then I can basically convert all of those into regular objects, so from instance to object. And now instead of being a bunch of instanced objects, now each one of these is going to be completely unique and modifiable. So after I've got my randomization and kind of my artistic placement down, then I can go in and I can start to make kind of these unique changes to each individual tree so that I can add, again, another layer of kind of artistic control over what was initially procedural setup. So that should give you a pretty good idea of the kinds of things that you can do with XGen and the different possibilities rather than just rendering it directly out of Maya. You can build these very complex setups and then actually just convert them to standard Maya objects so that you can use them outside of Maya either in another application. Uh, if I wanted to send these to Max for instance and use them in Max in order to render them out I could do that. Or if I wanted to send these into say for instance Unity or Unreal or a proprietary game engine I can use it as a an authoring tool and then ultimately get it into my engine just like I would any other object. So that pretty much wraps it up. I hope that was useful for you. Um, thanks for your time and we'll see you next time. Bye.